So my name is Barry Adams. It is uh, Wednesday, June the 11th, 2014. And I'm speaking today on the fatherheart.tv webcast. And uh, the message I'm, I'm talking about today is called Back to the Garden. And so uh, it's something that I've talked about in the past and I've made you know lots of references to in messages. But this is the first time that I've actually shared this particular message so we'll just I'm looking forward to what actually comes out of my mouth and I trust that uh, that you can spit out the bones and uh, just uh, graze on the meat of, of what uh, I have to say and so the, the first thing you know I'm not a theologian I am you know I'm very simple I have a grade 12 education I was a business guy for the first 18 years or first 19 years of my career and then I went into pastoral ministry for a little bit got you know just wrecked with this revelation that almighty god was my dad and you know started off and you know you know 15 years ago and i well close to 15 years ago 14 years ago in a full-time ministry after i left pastoral ministry just sharing this message about um the love of the father but there is this theological and and so when i share this i'm not sharing it from this deep theological perspective but there's something called the law of first mention when theologians talk about scriptures and doctrines and, and where the it's a theological way of understanding or taking note of the first time something is mentioned in the Bible so what basically what uh, the idea is about the law of first mention is that when something is mentioned for the first time it, it can establish a, a foundation for future future biblical references so so that means that if you if something is mentioned First, you pay attention of how it was mentioned, and then everything that comes after that is is a way for us to be able to know that the first mention of it was really important and very significant. And so then, it that first mention actually influences how we see it in the future. So that's what I want to talk about today. And of course, the first mention of everything is, as far as the the Bible goes, was the book of Genesis which is also called the the book of beginnings. So if we want to better understand God's plans and his purposes for humanity, for creation, then you know it's really important for us to be able to look at the book book of the beginnings, right? The book of the new beginnings, the book of Genesis. And so today I want to talk about um, the first mention of the creation of mankind and, and in Genesis Chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, this is the first reference to, the, uh, to man in the, New, in the Old Testament, in the Bible. And so this is what I'm reading from the World English Bible for most of the, the text that I'm using. In verse 26 it says, God said, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In God's image he created him. Male and female he created them. So this is the, the first account. This is the first mention of the creation of male and female, man and woman in, in Genesis chapter 1. And it's interesting to note this and I, you know, it's something that I it's kind of a, hadn't thought of it this way before. But when throughout the creation process, this is the sixth day of creation. For the first five days of creation, we we see God creating things, right? And they're pretty significant things, you know, day and night, and the skies and the ocean, and you know, all the vegetation and the animals and everything else. But before God creates man, it's like there is a family conference, like right? because we know that God is one, right? But we also know that God is expressed in three persons, and it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so three yet one. So within the, the Trinity of the Godhead, there is a community of love. And this community of love gets together after they've created everything, before they've created man, and they have a family conference. And this is the discussion they make when they say, let us make man in our image. So it, it's just one of those... Those neat little tidbits that I, that when you look at the creation process uh, before man was created, before Adam was created, that the, the the Trinity actually had this conversation, 
and of course they they said it was very good. In Genesis two seven, it talks about what how God created man, and of course man. When I say man, it was he wasn't named Adam at this time. It was just man, and before God created man. He spoke everything into being. He said, let there be light, and there was light, right? Let, you know, so he just spoke the creative process. But when it comes to man now, what does he do? He actually uses his hands. And Genesis 2, verse 7 says, Yahweh God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so the creation process when it comes to man was different than the creation process for everything else, all the stars in the sky, everything. And it, in Isaiah 64, verse 8, it says, But now, Yahweh, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. And we, are, we all are the work of your hand. And I think that's really, really significant to understand that when God created Adam, in the in um, he formed him out of out of dust. He formed him with his hands. And the Bible says in the creation process that he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And I don't know about you, but if I was to breathe into somebody's nostrils, I have to be really close to them. So in my mind, when I imagine the creation story, when when God created Adam and he breathed on him, I just wonder if it would have appeared that he was almost kissing him, that he would have been almost nose to nose with Adam. But however that worked, we know that he was, he was created in a, a place of intimacy and love. And again, because he was formed, it was totally different than what happened for the rest of creation. So this is the first mention of man. And in Genesis 8, Verse uh, two, verse uh, chapter two, verse eight and nine. It talks about Adam's new homestead, right? Where did God place Adam? So, <coughs> excuse me, but Adam was created, and we don't know where he was created uh, on the earth. You know, he was formed from the earth, from the dust of the earth. But he was planted in a in a garden. He was put into a garden. So let's just read that now Genesis two, verse eight and nine. It says, Yahweh God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and, he, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, Yahweh God made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the middle of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So this is, this is, this is where um, God placed Adam. And so this is what we're talking about, the garden. You know, and, and of course, the topic today is back to the garden so this is this glorious, most beautiful place where God placed him. Now, Adam's job was pretty simple. In Genesis 2, verse 15, it says, Yahweh God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That was, that was Adam's job description. And the Greek word, or the, <coughs> excuse me, the Hebrew word to, to, to dress it is to work, to serve, to keep, to labor. And the keep it word is to guard, protect, attend to. That was it. Adam's job was to, in, in a sense, and I love the idea that he was there to serve the garden, that he was there to protect and guard the garden. And, you know, that was as simple as it gets. You know, that he had nothing else to do. And, you know, keep in mind that the garden at that point was weed-free. Uh, he didn't have to water the plants. He didn't have to get a hose out and water everything because the Bible says that God brought mist from the ground to, to water the earth. So it, it, because there was no weeds, because there was no need to water, I mean, I think it was a fairly, very, fairly, in a sense, an easy job. It wouldn't have been the painful toil. It wouldn't have been from the sweat of his brow. He was just there to keep everything going and to serve it. And he had a helper, which was Eve. And I'm not going to get into this too much, um, other than to say, you know, in, in our theology over the years, the, the idea of uh, Eve being a, a helpmate, and she wasn't even named Eve until after the fall. So she was woman. She came from man. But in Genesis 2.18, Yahweh, I'm just going to read it. It says, Yahweh God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And, you know, sometimes when we think of that word helper, we do think of it in a more of a subservient kind of way. And John 
uh, actually had an, an amazing message about uh, masculinity and femininity where he really unpacked this word. And so I would encourage you to go back in the archives and, and look it up and uh, maybe John can type out in the uh, the chat the name of that talk. But it, he, he really unpacked this whole idea of the word, uh, I think it's a azer, or I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. The Hebrew word means to aid, to help. But it is also a the, the description of, of God. In Psalm 115, verse 9, uh, it says, Israel, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. And so the same word that um, describes the woman being a helper to Adam is the same word that is used to describe God and how he helps us. So the fact that that woman was actually a help to Adam is a pretty big deal and it's a pretty honorable thing that uh, God did for Adam to to actually complete him and having of course the the feminine expression of God that was um, as a part of the you know the Genesis 1 story where Eve, uh, the woman, is actually an equal expression of God as man is, right? Because male and female, he created them in his image. So, um, you know, I just wanted to, to say that because I, I just think that's, a, that's it needs to be said. But when we talk about life in the garden, there is a, there is a fundamental blessing that God pronounced on Adam and Eve. So man and woman, you know, you know what I mean. I'm, they'll be interchanged. When I, when I speak of these things, in Genesis 1.28, uh, it says, God blessed them, God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And when you look at life in the garden, think about this for a moment. There were no enemies there. As I mentioned earlier, it was a weed-free garden. So, you know, today, you know, we have a garden in our backyard. And, and, you know, my wife is always guarding the garden, watching for pests, watching for weeds, watching for all those things. But there would have been none of that in the garden itself. And the Bible says that, you know, there's inferences that um, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. Now, whether that's in the morning or in the, in the evening, what it does suggest is that there was this intimacy with God. That not only did Adam just over, his, his job was to oversee um, a garden that kind of looked after itself, you know, in, in the sense of just being able to be watered and the sun and everything else, but that he, he would walk with God in the cool of the day. And can you think about this for a second? Life in the garden where... Uh, the Bible says that God was uh, Adam was and Eve, or man and woman, were created in the image of God. So they looked like God. So when they walked in the garden, when they tended the garden, I wonder how creation responded to them. I wonder how the angelic host responded to them because they looked like God. So like when they would walk, and maybe they would have a double take and say, what, was that Adam or was that God? It's the most amazing thing that they were image bearers of Almighty God on the earth. And of course, he gave them the authority of the earth, right? That he gave them to the, the authority to be, have dominion and subdue the earth, right? So they not only carried his image, but they actually walked effortlessly in this place of exercising the authority that was given to them by Almighty God. And because they knew who they were, they were born in a place of love and, and acceptance, God is love, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 16. So they would have lived in a place of complete love and acceptance. They would have been cared for. They would have been protected. They would have been affirmed in their life, their calling, their destiny. They would have just been, they would have just been in this place of peace and rest and assurance. And they would have been in a place where there was no sin, there was no fear, there was no sickness, there was no suffering. And we know that they were even naked, without clothes, and they didn't even know it. So there was no shame, there was no self-consciousness. Could you imagine living in a place where all of those things were the reality? That you carried the affirmation and the authority and the image of God without shame, without fear, without anxiety, without the worries of this life, without needing, wondering how you're going to pay your bills. Well, that's how Adam and Eve lived their life. 
And it says in Luke 3.38, and it's the reverse genealogy, where it says that Adam was the son of God. He was the son of God. Where it starts with Jesus and ends with Adam. This is Adam, the son of God. So we, we actually see here the the um, into the heart of God that Adam was a son. And it was his desire that he would be able to live in this place of complete love. This is the first mention of, of mankind, right? That, in, that the first couple in this place of being completely loved and completely affirmed and knowing that since Adam was a son of God, then, then obviously there was a revelation that God was father because Adam was his son. So in this place of the father's love, in this garden where they wouldn't be carrying the weight of, of the world on their shoulders, they would have had lots and lots of kids. That was what the father's heart was. And each generation that would be in this place of love and acceptance <coughs> would experience everything that Adam, <coughs> excuse me, Adam and Eve would have experienced. And then, of course, because there would have been no death, that you know that Adam and Eve would have lived forever, and so they could have visited their great 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 grandparents anytime they wanted. And this is the garden experience that the Father intended. That that. The garden, the Bible says that, that his heart was that they would expand the garden and that the earth would be, you know, of course it's referred to later, that filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. And that, so that with every generation that would be able to work the garden, tend to the garden, under the Father's blessing, that the garden would have expanded and expanded until it, it can fill the entire earth. Now there was only one thing, there was one commandment that God spoke to man and woman, and he said that. So he see, he actually made the. It was to man. It wasn't to woman. He made the commandment to man in Genesis two verse sixteen and seventeen. It says Yahweh God commanded the man, saying, "Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die." Now, there is every possible tree, every possible delight in the garden. The tree of life was in the, right in the center of the garden. And God says to, to, to man, he says, there's only one thing that I ask. Isn't that you don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you eat of it, you're going you're gonna to die. So that's... You know, that was it, right? And I, I'm not going to go into a, a lengthy time. We don't have time to really unpack, you know, some of the dynamics of that and why and the tree of knowledge of uh, uh, good and evil versus the tree of life and why. But, you know, for me, in my own desire for simplicity, the, the thing that, I, how I would say it is that if, if I could kind of simplify the meaning of the tree of life versus the meaning of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, how I would... Uh, be able to, to describe it as is that the tree of life uh, was just simply represented complete dependence upon God. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented complete independence from God. Where we do not need God to tell us w what is right and what is wrong. We, don't, we can actually figure it out ourselves. We can use our own intellect and our own understanding to understand not only the things that are evil, but the things that are good. And so that we have created a religious system, so to speak, where that the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil, I, we don't need to be dependent upon God. But if we would have just, if Adam would have just simply partook of the tree of life, he would have lived forever and he would have never, ever needed to be independent and separate. But, you know, I don't have time to actually uh, unpack that any more than that. In Genesis 3, and I'd encourage you to read the whole, whole chapter, but this is basically the trap that Satan sent when he came as a serpent. And in Genesis 3, verse 1 to 7, it talks about this. And really, what Satan actually did was he, he really questioned the goodness of God. You know, he, he says to Eve, you know, he, he goes, well, to woman, it wasn't Eve yet. Has God really said, right? Like, did God really say this? And in and, and essence, what he was saying to Eve was, is God really good? He, he is actually insecure. He is actually threatened by you that if you partake of the tree and knowledge of good and evil, you will be just like him and you won't need him and you can figure things out yourself. And we know that that, you know, that they... 
Adam and Eve bought into the lie. I mean, uh, you know, we know that Adam was close by. It wasn't Eve. It wasn't like you know, a woman. It wasn't her. You know, a lot of times she gets a bad rap for why all this happened. But it, it was Adam and Eve together that did this. And uh, the reality is, is when they said, "No, we're gonna. Tr we we don't want to be." Even even the trap of saying, "Would you be like God?" You know that that in itself sounds very very attractive, right? Like, w why wouldn't I want to be like God? So if I took of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, if I'm going to be like God, well, let's go for it. But the truth is, God said to Adam before, "Don't do this." And and so you know, long story short, it happened, and the result of that was immediately that they recognized they were naked. And their eyes were open, and they felt shame for the first time. And of course, we know that they found some fig leaves to cover their their nakedness. And you know, mankind has been looking for fig leaves ever since. And so, the the whole idea of of just that covering of just being in dependence with God was totally shattered at that moment. Now, you know, and again, I won't have time to get into the all the details with this. But we know that uh, Father had to banish them from the garden, but it was for their own protection. Because if they would have taken of the tree of life and good, uh, tree of life after they would have partaken of the tree of knowledge of the good, uh, good and evil, they would have lived forever in a sinful state. And of course, we know that sin, uh, all it does is, is disfigures and maims. And so, in God's mercy and His love, He did, He wanted to protect them from eating of the tree of life after they had partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this is what it says in Genesis 3, verse 22 to 24. Yahweh God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore Yahweh God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubs at the east of the Garden of Eden in the flame of a sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And I can't imagine, you know, uh, they say that if you want to hurt a parent, the best way to hurt a parent is to hurt their children. And I cannot Im imagine how our father felt right at that moment when he had to banish them. He had to drive them from the garden. They didn't know where else to go, right? So the pain that he would have experienced at that point is nothing that we would be able to ever identify with. And um, I think, you know, oftentimes when we're thinking about God banishing them and, and driving them out, you know, often we may think that, oh, that was unfair or unjust or whatever. But the truth of the matter is it, it came from a loving heart. And life outside the garden. Now this is, you know, up until this point, and I, I mentioned all the wonderful things about living in the garden, but for the first time in all of humanity, you know, after being completely loved, after living in peace, and, and just having that sense of covering, that sense of authority, that sense of affirmation, now they were outside of the garden, Adam and Eve, and that's where Eve got her name, and that's when all of the, the sin and the suffering, and the pain, the sickness and death, the cursed ground, the thorns and the, the, the thistles, the painful toil, all of the things that came as a result of the fall started when they left the garden. And this was the result of the unholy alliance with, with the great orphan. Now one of the, the, the quotes that I, I absolutely love that uh, James Jordan has used over the past, and, and uh, I, you know, I use it often too, is because it's, to me it's, it's probably one of the most simplistic ex explanations of the gospel. And uh, it, it's just this, he, he says, Father lost his kids in the garden, and he wants them back. And I really believe that that is the very essence of the gospel message, that, that the first mention of, of humanity was that God had a plan and a purpose for Adam and Eve, for man and woman, for you and I, for every person from Adam until today, that we would be in a place of complete love and acceptance, that we would have lived in the garden, that we would have expanded the garden, that we would have never known a day of pain and suffering and sin and but because of the fall of Adam, because of the nature of, of the giving him yielding the authority that God gave him when he gave it to to Satan, the serpent, you know, at that moment, then uh, from that moment until today, we have seen all kinds of pain and suffering. And it's never been the Father's intent. And I just want to encourage you today that it's never been His intent for us to experience the pain uh, and loss that we have. 
And it's interesting to note that even before God created the world, he made provision for our sin. He, made, he saw, he, and it wasn't like he, he did it, but he, he foresaw what Adam would do, Eve would do, that they would partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and all of the devastating consequen consequences. In Revelation 13, verse 8, it says that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God made a plan even before he created Adam and Eve, that there would be a way in which we could be redeemed, that we could be brought back to the garden. In John three sixteen and 17, uh, Jesus says himself, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But God didn't send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. You see, this is the heart, this is the plan of salvation to bring us back, to restore what was lost. And in John 14, verse 18, Jesus says these words. He says to his disciples before he goes to the cross, he says, I will not leave you as you orphans, I will come to you. But earlier, Jesus said, he said, I only speak the words I hear my Father speaking. The Son can do nothing of himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. So everything that Jesus did and said was an expression of his Father's heart. He never said a word independent to his, his father. He always spoke what he heard his father saying. So when Jesus said in John 14, verse 18, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. The question that I have with that is I wonder if, if, it, that if Jesus was saying at that moment the, the, what, the words that maybe came out of the heart of God the Father as he even drove Adam and Eve out of the garden. Could you imagine if it was at that brokenhearted father having to banish his kids from the garden for their own safety? And I wonder if even at that moment, if he might have cried these words, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you in an orphan state. I will come to you. And when Jesus said these words before he went to the cross, I really believe that this was a fulfillment of the cry of a father that began in a garden many, many years before that. And then after Jesus rose from the dead in John 20, 17, this is the resurrection message. This is the first message that Jesus said to Mary when he came out of the tomb. In John 20, 17, it says this, Don't hold to me, for I ha haven't yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. You see, I really believe that God wants us to be able to get a grasp on what it means to be redeemed. You know, the Bible calls God the Redeemer and that Jesus redeemed us. And the word redeem means to buy back, to recover something. It's like when we redeem a coupon, we take the coupon that started with the store, they sent it out somewhere, we got it and we redeem it. We give it back to them for a discount. You see, you and I, when Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead, he made the way to redeem you and I back to our original purpose, and that was in the garden. You see, our Father saved the best for last. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, it says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. See, this is the good news of the gospel. And later on in that same verse, in verse uh, chapter in verse 45 of 1 Corinthians 15, <coughs> it says, So it also it is written, The first man... Adam became a living soul, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. You see, and Jesus is called the last Adam, the second Adam. He is the one in which now we are in and all things have become new. We are new creatures in Christ. We are a new species. You know, that word new creation is it's like we are a new species in Christ. that It's never existed before. This, you know, that we are now united with God in the new covenant now. The garden, you know, there was a garden in, in Eden, but the garden that is referred to in the New Covenant comes from John chapter 15, and I'd encourage you to read the whole chapter. But in verse 1, Jesus simply says, and this is the NIV, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. This is the, the New Covenant. This is the new tree of life. This is the new garden in which you and I are a part of. And in verse 5 it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, Adam 
needed to partake of the tree of life. He needed to eat of the tree of life. Now, because of what Jesus did in the new covenant, by joining us with him, he is the vine and we're his branches, we have now been joined to the tree of life. We have not only partake of it, but we are part of the tree of life because we are joined with Jesus. It's the most amazing thing. Because of our union with Jesus, we are now caught up in the, the triune love that God has for us. In John 17, 23, before Jesus goes to the cross, he's praying a simple prayer and he says this, I in them and you in me, Father, that they may be perfected into one, that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. You see, this is the garden experience that you and I are called into because of what Jesus did. We are so united with Jesus. We are one with Jesus. And Jesus is one with the Father. So then our oneness with, with the Father, Jesus said in John 14, he says, I will come and my Father will come and we will make our home in you. It is the most amazing thing. You see, we can live in the garden now. We are part of that tree of life, that everlasting vine, Jesus Christ, because of our union with him. We are his branches. And what is the job of a branch but to receive from the vine? A, 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 a branch cannot be independent from the vine. All a branch does is simply live in dependence of the life flow that comes from the vine. And now that's what you and I are called to do. Not to be separate, not to try to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but to partake and to just live in him we live and move and have our being and just to enjoy the rich uh, life flow that comes by, from Jesus. In John 15, verse 8 and 9, Jesus says, In this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. And then in verse 9 he says, Even as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. And John prayed that uh, pray uh, at the beginning of this webcast, he said that we would just abide in the love that God has for us. And you see, how do we live in in the garden, uh, the, the, the reality of the garden? It is just by remaining in the love that God has for us, by resting in that love, by simply being a branch, by living through the life flow that comes from our other brother, Jesus Christ. And the fruit that brings glory to the Father, I truly believe, is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, is it fruit in you know salvations and doing the work and all those things? Yeah, yeah, of course those things are fruitful. But the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. You see, I truly believe that the more that you and I understand that we are now joined with Jesus and so that the tree of life, in him is life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it super abundantly, John 10.10, 10, that we would understand that there is a garden experience that God wants you and I to, to begin to unpack this side of heaven. And I truly believe that the restoration of the original blessing in Adam and Eve to be fruitful, multiplying, to have dominion that was spoken of in Genesis 1.28 has been restored to us in a much more profound way. In Ephesians 1, 3 to 5, this is what uh, how Paul writes about the restoration of the original blessing. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and without blemish before him in love, having predestined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his desire. You see, the, the restoration of the original blessing is ours now in Christ. We don't have to fight for it. We don't have to wage war in a outside of the garden kind of way and in toil and pain and sin and, and competitive. We can just be connected to the tree of life himself, and that is Jesus. And in that place of every spiritual blessing in heavenly places is ours. The Bible says in Romans 8, chapter verse 15, um, it says, we have not received a spirit of fear that causes us to be in slavery, but we've received the spirit of sonship where we cry, Abba, Father. And the spirit of God bears witness with our spirit, telling us that we are God's children and God's heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. 
You see, this is the most amazing thing, that God wants us to have a garden experience where we can live in the garden, that, that, that restoration to all that was lost, all that was stolen, that it would be ours again. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at this and I think, yeah, wow, this is amazing. Living in a place, what does it look like for you and I to be able to live in the garden, our path back to the garden again, back to sonship, back to intimacy with the Father, back to being an image bearer of God, back to that place of having his authority, back to that place of serving the garden, tending the garden, guarding the garden, guarding whatever he has entrusted us. Now, you know, when I think of that, I go, wow, that's re that's wonderful. But, you know, the reality is the world that you and I live in is is really not the Garden of Eden, right? It's, you know, if we look at, around us and we look at the wars and the rumors of wars and the sickness and the sin and the greed and the lust and the disease and in in all of the pain and all of the hurt and all of the suffering that's in that's in humanity. When I look outside my my front window, I am not looking at at a garden. I am looking at a broken orphan world. And I think that's why Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 30 through, he said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, we, we live with this contradiction. And, and there is a, there's a contradiction in the sense that there's a world that we live in uh, which is broken and hurting, and all of the all of the consequences of sin are around us, right? But yet, the Bible says that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And so then we we have this this offer from God to to be joined with Jesus, to be seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father, Father hid in Christ with God, that we would be clothed with compassion and clothed with humility, and that we would live in love as God is love, that we would you know begin to to live in that place of complete love. Yet the world that we're around is outside of the garden. We live outside of the garden, but inwardly, the garden is here. The kingdom of God is within, the Bible says. Jesus said that. So that there's this contradiction. And I really believe what God is after is that you and I could, could by faith, courageously face this, this seeming contradiction that we live in this world, but inside... There is, a, uh, there is a, a wellspring. The Bible says, Jesus said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And I really believe 1 John 5, 4 says, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And I really believe that when we, even if we cry out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, that you know, the more that we can choose to believe what God says is true. Choose to believe that he is a loving father. Choose to believe that Jesus died for us and that, that he has redeemed us. He has restored us back to our original purpose. The more that we can choose to, in, in our weakness and our brokenness, cry, oh, oh, Father, I believe that to the best of my ability, help the areas of my unbelief. I truly believe that, that it, it's we are doing something this side of heaven in the face of the contradiction that we are, are declaring to God that this is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. And that the more that we can do that, I really believe that it demonstrates our trust towards God. And I really believe that it, it actually encourages him. Because in the midst of be, living outside of the garden in the natural realm, God wants us to be able to come more and more into a place of living inside the garden within our own heart. See, the truth of the matter is, is that the Father loved us so much that he put his own spirit in our hearts as a deposit. And that is a hope. So what, what, what that says in, in 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, Paul writes and he says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. You see, I really believe that the Spirit of God that is in you, the Spirit of God that is in me, is a deposit. It's a reminder. Okay, we're, you know, we have not seen the fulfillment of this, but we are, this is where we are going. That we have this deposit in us as a reminder that there is an inheritance that is ours that's going to come. It's guaranteed. It's in the bank. 
And that faith partners with the Spirit of God that is in us and says yes and amen. Even though that we live in a world, we live in an orphan world, we live in a fatherless world, we live in a, a world that's outside of the garden, that we can believe that we have a deposit that is guaranteeing our inheritance. I absolutely love what, uh, what Paul says because he talks about the reality of the suffering that we have in the midst of the world that we live in. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17, Paul writes, he says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is is eternal. You see, we all have struggles. We all have fears and anxieties. We have bad things that happen to us. We have bad things that happen to the, those around us who we love. Because we are not living in the external in the garden that God intended for us. But the truth of the matter is, is that if we can understand that from an eternal perspective, not from a temporal perspective, but if we can fix our eyes on the things that are unseen, that it can change our perspective and that God God would just be able to help us to live in the reality of the, the, in, the eternal one that lives within us and that we could have a perspective of eternity, we could be, have a perspective of the hope that is waiting for us. And the reality, and this is the last scripture, then we're going to wrap up. The end of the story is, is Eden is restored, you know, in the sense, and it's a better deal than the first one. This is a better covenant. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1 to 3, at, at, you know, at the end of all things, when we're, you know, we're up, you know, we're with the Father, He wipes away every tear from our eyes, takes away all the pain we've suffered. It, it describes where we're going to live for all of eternity. And Revelation 22, 1 to 3 says this, He showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street, on this side of the river, and on that, that was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruits, yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will be no curse anymore. The throne of God and, the, and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants serve him. I just want to just pray that, I, you know, when I'm done praying, John, if you could come on. But I just want to pray because I, I, I just wonder if some of you today are, might be discouraged that you might feel the weight of the broken world, the living outside the garden that is all around us and, and things that maybe happened to you in your life that are unfair, unjust, that have caused pain, that caused you to walk with a limp, you know, spiritually or emotionally or physically. And I just want to pray that the Father would, in his love today, would, hey, just bring an encouragement to you, that, that the love of God would just encourage you and strengthen you today, and that there would be a reminder that there is a promise, uh, uh, that there is a way back to the garden, and that way is Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So, Father, I pray right now, in the name of our brother Jesus Christ, I pray for encouragement to go across the airway, I pray for encouragement to go in the recording. I pray that there would be a sense of your encouragement and your strengthening to your kids right now all around the world, that they would know that there is hope. I pray that where there's hopelessness, there would be hope. I pray where there's faithlessness, I pray that faith would rise up. I pray, Father, that we would see the truth, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And, Father, that our even in our weakness, that we would cry out, yes, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And I just pray, Father, right now that your kids would know that they're loved, that there's a plan and a purpose, there's a destiny that you've called them to, that you have... In, you, you have destined them for greatness, that you have destined them for a garden. You have destined them for holiness, not because of their own works, but because of being joined with Jesus Christ. That now we are part, we are living in the garden of God. Even now, in our inward being, there is a new spiritual reality, even if around us, 
there's a, we are outside of the garden, if we are in a broken world, Father, I just pray now by the power of your spirit that you would encourage and strengthen your kids. I pray that your love would come. I pray, Father, that we would know that we could just receive and remain in the love that, we, that God has for us, that the way that you, you love Jesus, that Jesus loves us, and that we are in him, and that we are connected to you through our union with Jesus. I just pray, Father, that you just would come now. By the power of your spirit, would you just give life to your kids. I pray that the tree of life that is in us, Father, that we are the garden of God, that you are the gardener and we're the branches. Father, even when you prune us, that just that shows that you're closer. That uh, in Jack Winter used to say that the gardener is never closer to the branch than when he's pruning it. So, Father, even in times of pruning, that we would know that you love us and that you are pruning us so that we would become more fruitful, that there would be more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more gentleness, more self-control, more kindness. Father, I just pray that there would be an overwhelming fruitfulness, that we would know that we live under the Father's blessing. We know that we live in an open heaven that we've been blessed in, 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 with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places by virtue that we are your kids. So thanks, Dad. Thank you that there is a restoration. Thank you that we are redeemed back to the garden. I just pray that you would show us how to live in our hearts, in the inner place of our being, that the kingdom is within, and that we would pray, Father, and our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, just like it's in heaven. Father, I just pray that you would just be a manifestation that the rivers of life, the rivers of living water would gush out of your kids in every area, area of the world today. That it would gush in families, it would gush in, in businesses, it would gush on the streets. That, Father, that even in this midst of this broken world that, that lives outside of the garden, that they would have a taste. People around us would begin to taste and see that the Lord is good by virtue of the life flow of sons and daughters, just being sons and daughters, not being anything else but remaining in love, knowing we're loved, knowing we're your sons and your daughters, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. So thanks, Dad, for that. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that it was always your plan to put us in a garden, to call us your sons and daughters, and to care for us for all eternity. Just pray a blessing on each one in Jesus' name. Amen.